We're going to give it just a minute before we get started. All right, in the interest of time, because we have a lot of information to cover, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. I'm Tanya Verkaitis, the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility, Pennsylvania. Today, we are bringing you the importance of being a watchdog. Our host will be Christina DiGiulio, our environmental chemist. A couple of notes before we get started. Please put your questions in the Q&A so that we're able to track them. Feel free to share any comments or thoughts in the chat. If you put questions in the chat, we'll try to keep up with them, but we can't promise. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Christina DiGiulio. As I've just introduced, um, I am here to talk about the importance of being a watchdog. Um, so I've been a um, a watchdog in on the Mariner East here in Pennsylvania, um, and it's it's been seven years of um, a, a learning curve, I guess. And so I'm here to share what I've learned. Um, so we're going to start with watchdogging and reporting, and what we'll cover, which is going to be why it's important to watchdog, what to look for, the good practices in documenting, how to report violations, and document your reporting, know your rights. And then we're going to talk about an individual versus a team effort. And I'm going to go over a case study um, that has uh, been a large part of my life here. Um, so why watchdog? Well, because you can be more than a bystander. Um, you know, we're dealing with an industry in the fossil fuel or fracking infrastructure, the, the system of uh, that I call it, uh, that it's a self-regulated in industry. And that means that they're the ones who are reporting everything. It's not as if a regulator is coming in and saying, oh, you know, we're the ones checking you. The industry itself checks itself. Um, so other reasons, we know the DEP is understaffed and underfunded. And that the, the Department of Environmental Protection is what we have in Pennsylvania, because I know there's going to be people possibly outside of Pennsylvania on this. Um, they're underfunded. And so we also have the duties uh, to to protect the health and safety of our community members um, and protection of our assets, protection of local environment. Uh, and, you know, early, we want to do this early and prevent further damage. The whole point as a water protector um, is that I want to protect the water. And that means I don't want to be cleaning it up. And a lot of what you're going to see here is actually documenting what has happened. I wish we could stop it. Um, and then here to educate and engage local residents, first responders, and local elected officials. So what to look for, and we're gonna be identifying behaviors in this. And when I say that, meaning, you know, we all understand our communities the most, and when you see changes, trust it. Trust your gut, because um, a lot of times the behaviors aren't matching their words. We've seen this over and over again. Um, and we wanna talk about like, Poor practices. We, in, I'm a chemist, and so in that we have something called good laboratory practices. Um, there are good practices in most things, and I'm, I'm also learning how to identify poor practices in that. Um, you know, identifying behaviors or surveyors, for example, when we don't, it may not be construction, but the pri the first thing you see when these um, infrastructure pro projects go in is um, surveyors. And we're going to look at uh, certain things like signs of a problem, like water running where it shouldn't be, discolored water, smells, tastes, sounds. Um, I really want everybody to understand that as a person, we are biosensors and we need, um, as a chemist, I have chemical sensors, but, you know, the biosensors are the key indicators. Um, we have to start trusting our our bodies and what they tell us. Um, and, you know, because if we don't, it, it leads to health impacts, um, you know, looking for like things like new containment structures, suck trucks, I call them, which is in the image uh, you see up here in the, um, the above uh, the workers that you see, suck trucks and uh, an increase in special, uh, you know, especially truck traffic, especially people in, um, that are around fracking, they know the water trucks uh, come right, you know, in to provide water to frack pads. Um, so that's when you see an increase in something, it's a very good indicator. Security, 
Oh, this is a good one. Security posted on or near the site. When you all of a sudden see somebody looking out and acting like they own the place um, and they're protecting, we don't know what, uh, that's an indicator to probably pay attention. Um, and then another one is uh, light, noise, and other work happening at night. Night is a, a, a <laughs> one of the areas in which these guys love to um, operate in because everybody's asleep. Um, so what to document? Let's talk about it. You could go crazy doing, uh, you know, documenting, but, um, as I always say, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a picture and capturing it because you're capturing a moment in time. So we're looking for identifying features such as markings on pipes. If you're, uh, in the world of pipeline fighting, which I am, um, and you can see a picture right there of all these markings, these API, uh, it's, these are very, uh, this is under FIMSA regulations. They are, um, very good identifying characteristics of a pipe to tell you what it is they're actually putting into the ground. And a lot of us are starting to hear about hydrogen and CO2. And this information literally tells you how these things are being built and what their capacity or abilities are. And getting those numbers is so critical when you see a pipe laying around. Take the numbers. Survey markers, as you can see, uh, the one marker that has the pink on it, it's a row. And row means right of way. Um, and that's a industry language um, in, the, in, when in, in regards to easements. Um, and looking at the behaviors, documenting their behaviors, has there been a change in behavior? Document yourself, right? This is a protection for yourself because, you know, when you're out there, you're alone sometimes, which I always encourage a buddy system when we're watchdogging. But if you're unable to, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're documenting where you're at, where you're standing. Um, also document security. It's interesting when you get pictures of a uh, security uh, personnel taking a picture of you. It's interesting to me. Um, illegal activities. And for example, if you see this license plate, uh, the truck there with that yellow, that's actually a truck that has covered their license plate on a public road, which is illegal. And they don't want us taking pictures of their plates to identify them. So that's a, that's a big indicator. But, and then also, we're going to be documenting violations through several um, or, you know, different types of uh, laws, as you can see here, FIMSA, environmental health and safety. All right. So what kind what types of violations are we looking for? Well, environmental, obviously, with air quality releases, you can read this, um, you know, there's air quality and water typically uh, is what's covered in the environmental um, as well. We have to consider our health and safety, meaning sound pollution, light pollution, um, sometimes equipment failures, like, so if there's lack of maintenance of their equipment or they have equipment that's like, you know, burning really terribly uh, dark, you know, fugitive particles like a diesel engine and, you know, there's something wrong in their maintenance of their equipment. They, you know, that's a good thing to document because it's um, actually harming your environment and um, your health and safety, especially when they've gone through, for example, here in Chester County, Pennsylvania, we had um, uh, the mariners going through um, our backyards, basically. Uh, within 50 feet of some homes. And so these this company energy transfer was camped out for four years in people's backyards. So we had a lot of time to watch them. Um, and also one of the things I wanna make very clear at trespass and lack of notification. And later in this slide, I'm gonna show you something about the P uh, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission new rules. And based upon what we did in Mariner East, they now are saying that you know land agents, and I'm sure a lot of people who've uh, dealt with um, this infrastructure knows who a land agent is. Um, I'm not going to get into that. But if anybody has questions, ask it. And, um, you know, trespassing is if they're not giving you notification that they're coming on your property or their easement, they don't own your property. They have an easement and they still have to notify the homeowner prior to going on their property. So, you know, I would say call the police if somebody is trespassing and make sure you put no trespassing signs up on your property. Um, identifying violations. So, First and foremost, when you're dealing with um, a lot of these permitted, uh, you know, projects, you, you have the permits on hand so you know what's going on. Reporting violations of environmental laws is the other thing. So Clean Water Act, Clean Streams Law, which is specific to Pennsylvania, and Clear Clean Air Act. The Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act are obviously federal. So some of the things um, to look for in what I have experienced um, are inadvertent returns or frack out on the land or into a waterway. Um, we've seen several sinkholes and you can see the picture up top on the right. That's a sinkhole that occurred through their horizontal directional drilling process in the Mariner East. Um, and all the stuff they're wiping up is called um, a drilling fluid. 
Um, so that came up in somebody's yard and this local, uh, this, uh, this actual picture, uh, there was three other sinkholes. That is uh, a violation that's disturbing the, you know, uh, subsurface soil in a karst, which, uh, or a uh, area with um, like limestone, which is very susceptible to collapse and whatnot. Uh, erosion sediment control failures, which is something that um, our Pennsylvania DEP uh, actually permits and they are supposed to maintain. So when you see these failures, you know, it's going to get into the waterways of Pennsylvania, which is actually a violation of law. Um, the whole reason why they have protections of this uh, groundwater aquifer disturbances, which we've seen a lot of this in this um, in fracking infrastructure or fracking projects. A lot of water has been harmed. And one of the things we've seen is like actually holes punctured in aquifers, which they start running out. So they're it's like draining an aquifer. Um, broken or malfunctioning equipment, illegal releases and leaks, and then um, sound and light violations. And with that, you have to literally check your um, local ordinances for um, those because um, at least in my area, uh, you know, it's a um, quite population dense area. They do not allow um, sound or work at, or any light um, after certain times, like they have to be done by 7 p.m. and so people can you know have their day after work, not have to listen to the noise. Um, other events, not just violations, we're looking at watchdogging is about capturing a moment in time and 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 documenting behaviors. Just because you know something is actually permitted doesn't mean it's always right for the community. It doesn't mean it's not harmful. So it's very important, especially when it comes to your health impacts. Um, you know, documenting your your own health impacts is so critical. Um, changes to your drinking water, if you taste different or anything to that effect, start asking questions and document it by getting your water tested and um, looking around and seeing what's what possibly could have, you know, caused this. Air pollution, trucks and placards, specifically tr the placards on trucks, make sure you're taking pictures of what those trucks are carrying. Um, and if the placards are not there, uh, take a picture of that and make it known. Flaring, uh, behavior changes again, uh, cleanups, uh, a lot of things you know, that happen when they fail. Uh, we, as soon as the cleanup occurs, everybody thinks it's done, but you need to watch how they're cleaning up because I found that they are not even doing that correctly sometimes. Uh, and always when there is construction going on, keep your eyes on them at all times. Um, I have learned that, you know, when I keep my eyes on them, they actually end up slowing, having to slow down to do it right. Um, I've seen walls put up, tents put up, um, and, you know, I have a drone. So, like, when they put a gigantic wall up, why? what are they hiding if they're doing everything so, you know, well? Um, and then surveying, which, again, that is the precursor to construction coming. So it's very important for your community to understand what's coming in by looking at, you know, those indicators of uh, pre-construction. Because a lot of this comes to us. It comes at us you know, decisions are made without our consent. So let's talk about the good practices in documenting private property and easements. So it's very important that when we're doing this, we're talking, we're, we're aware of where we're, we're stepping because the worst thing you could do in documenting is, you know, do something in, in, in regards to illegal or um, not having permission from a property owner being on there. I know you want to capture things, but be very careful. You, that data might even be unusable if you if you're um, doing something illegal. So, you know, don't stand on an easement. And when I say easement, if you look down uh, at the picture with the pipeline marker there, and you can see that the trees have been cleared, it's fragmenting of our uh, forests. And uh, that that's an easement. And typically, these easements for pipelines are about fifty feet. And so, when I say don't stand on the easement, um, when the workers are working you can, if it's public property, can be on the easement, but when they're working, you cannot obstruct or impede their work. Um, so be very conscious of that. Um, respect homeowners' privacy. I always in my community have asked, even when people say you can go on my property at any time, I still notify them by a text or something to let them know that I'm going on their property because people get busy in their life. And if they see somebody randomly run, running around on their property, you know, it could lead to just, you know, more trauma or just even, it's just not even appropriate to put somebody in that position. So I always make sure that I'm fully communicating with people. Um, 
and it's a, it's a respect. I wouldn't want that done to me. And, um, you know, health and safety, it, this is very critical as watchdogs and people who go out and do this, make sure, do not take any unnecessary safety risks. Safety is first, it's key. So also avoiding um, exposure to contaminants as much as possible, um, using personal protective equipment um, and be aware of what you may be bringing home with you. What we tell the industry workers and what we've understood, especially when it comes to uh, one of the topics of radiation and fracking that, you know, whatever you're walking through and then you go home and, you know, walk through your house, you have children crawling around the ground, animals, you're bringing that contamination home. So be very conscious of isolating your equipment that may be uh, contaminated and keeping it outside of your home. Um, a good practice in documenting, this is pictures and videos. One of the biggest assets we have is our cell phones. Like, so, you know, still images, why still images versus video? If you're ever trying to uh, send something to, for example, the news or the media, a lot of times they're not going to put a video up. So you want to make sure you take still images as well as with the regulators and some of these um, ways that we, what you'll, which you'll see later in this um, presentation, um, when you want to report a violation to the EPA or DEP, they do not set videos typically, but um, because they're too large of files, but still images work and you want to capture it for that evidence to show that you you caught it. Capturing the moment before the evidence disappears. That's the whole point of this. You never know what you're taking, but trust your intuition. Take a picture because once it's gone, it's gone forever. Um, most people have a cell phone. And I really say this. Anybody can be a watchdog because if you have a cell phone and a camera, take a picture. It's that easy instead of you know, I've had people that have called me and be like, I saw this. I'm like, did you take a picture of it? Because it's hard for people to explain what they see, um, especially when, you know, it's a new learning curve for somebody. They're like, these big machines came in. And I'm like, well, what kind of machine <laughs> doesn't help me? Because I can't run out at every uh, moment at every call that I get. Um, and the other thing is make sure everything is time stamped, GPS stamped. Yes, there is metadata in that. But when you do time stamped um, imagery, you uh it's actually on the video or on the um face like it's seen in it where you're located it helps with um you know proving your case um video same thing and then uh, with other videos live streaming has been a very big asset in my um life uh because when i can't have a buddy with me uh live feeding brought my whole team with me and i was uh, being watched and being supported in the field there's a time to live stream and there's a time to not live stream um so when you have a live stream and like, let's say there's any interaction with uh, the police, you do not want to be live streaming that. I would say turn your camera off at that time, but also turn a camera on that has a, you know, a private or like your timestamp GPS stamp camera uh, video is a good idea. And what to say on a live feed is, you know, explain where you're at, the location where you're at and, you know, help people walk through and continuously on that live feed. If you're on there for a while is to keep continually because uh, people jump on and jump off. You want to continually repeat that. Hi, I'm in Chester County. I'm here documenting in Upper Yukon Township for the Mariner East. Um, and what we're seeing right now is a horizontal directional drilling and an inadvertent return, for example. Um, and then one of the best benefits, um, I've, the best tools that I think I have purchased in this is a drone because of, it's a bird's eye view and there's no walls that can stop it. Um, and there's a lot of laws protecting your drone in the air through the FAA, it's illegal for anybody to impede your the flying of your drone. Um, so you can, and then the other thing is that you can actually keep a safe distance from very hazardous situations, which is very important. You don't wanna keep exposing yourself to something that's hazardous. We need the watchdogs to remain. All right, so I have uh, this video, hopefully it works. Um, but this is a pneumatic hammer drill, which happened in quarantine during, the, um, during our COVID pandemic um, in 2020. Um, they were hammer drilling. And one of the things about documenting, this is called a decibel meter, and it's an app that you can get. It's called Decibel X, this one specifically. And what you're doing is actually recording the noise level because, you know, they're allowed to have some noise for a certain amount of time. It's pretty complicated, um, but we actually had in our shifting paradigms a wonderful um you know, group that came in on one of ours, which is on our website for PSRPA, it explains uh, the harms of uh, sound. And um, when I say, think about these parents are now homeschooling for the first time, and there's this loud noise. If it doesn't work, the sound and you don't hear it, um, just look at the decibels going up on the uh, meter.
and okay so i don't know if people we were trying to do this earlier and it may or may not have but you can see the depth decibels and i'm pretty far away i was in my car and as well like this is in people's backyards while their children are trying to learn which is a very big distraction if you look down on the um to the right the noise levels the hammer drill down there that's what it typically um reads at which is my the peak if i let it play anymore would have been up into the hundreds which is not good for your ears and imagine how distracting that is for people who are trying to homeschool and learn <laughs> when they're um, quarantined in their houses um so here we're going to talk about good practices and documenting and this is about workers, security, police, and regulators. Yes, you do want to document your regulators. Um, so I've had a lot of interaction with all. I always say be cordial and, and respectful because what you're there to do is capture the information, not cause problems. You want to be as um, not covert, but as you know, non-confrontational as possible and just making sure that you're capturing as much as possible. So you don't want to distract yourself or anybody else. You just don't want to be seen sometimes. Um, and I would say if workers do say something to you, you know, I, I tend to try not to respond. Um, you know, I would just make sure that you stay, especially if you're videoing, stay, make sure you're mindful of what you're saying to them. Um, you know, follow directions, obviously, if they tell you stop, step off the easement, step off the easement. Um, but also understand they try to play that meaning you're on a public sidewalk and you are absolutely allowed to be on a public sidewalk because you're not impeding or preventing them to, from doing their work. So it's the rules about that come down. So they, a lot of times the industry sh tries to tell you, oh, you're, um, you're in our, on, on our public sidewalk. But yes, their easement goes through the sidewalk, but our public sidewalk, we're allowed to walk through it. So I can stand on it. They can't tell me to get off of it. And the thing I ask is, am I impeding or obstructing your ability to work? Um, so what to expect from private security? You're going to be photographed, so get used to it. You're photographing somebody else. Um, you may be asked to leave. You don't have to if you're in public property or if you have permission from a property owner. Um, you may be threatened with calls to the police. That's happened so many times in my life. Um, and, you know, I say go call them because I haven't done anything wrong. Um, of course, document everything. And what to do if uh, police are called? Well, you're, you have to know your rights and... Um, of course, like I said, on live feeding, make sure you remove yourself from live feed, but continue to record because the police are going to come up with their body cameras and they're going to record. So it's their evidence versus yours. I always say protect. And here's um, a little example of uh, workers in um, West Wright Township. Closing it up so nobody they're, can see in. Yeah, they're closing Aww. the walls because we are peeking what through it. Hi, you guys. And so That's what I was funny. doing is just documenting that. And I'm going to walk around this and I don't have to show you all of it, but I want to show that these workers were scrambling because there was gaps in this wall that they put up um, and we were peeking through it in order to see what was going on. And that's how desperate they were to cover it up. So when those behaviors occur, you're doing something right. I guarantee you. Sorry. All right. So knowing your rights this is very important. And as you can see me, I'm taking a picture of the workers who are actually, you can't see it, but they were taking pictures of me and they were following everywhere I went. And if you can see that I'm against the wall, there's also a utility pole there. And anywhere from 50 feet, I believe it's from the middle of the road. If there's a utility pole, they cannot tell me that I am trespassing or anything because it's actually public property. So it's about knowing those things. Um, it's really important to check with your, you know, your local um, authorities, your township to know that everything is okay. Once you get that information, you can pretty much move as freely as possible and safely. Um, so, you know, each municipality has different rules, uh, public versus private property. These are the things I would say, and I usually say these on my videos. I have the permission of the property owner or I am on public property in my video. Um, if you you do have the right to document, don't ever let them tell you that you cannot in a public area take video of them. That's a very good, that's a tactic that's common that they utilize um, to try to intimidate you. And this is an intimidation tactic. And you know, these are people who are not even from here. This, they're from Texas or wherever they are in my area. And they're telling me how I can behave in my, um, you know, my community that is not going to work for me. So I always make sure if they try to do that in my video, say I am not impeding or preventing the work or progress of this project. Um, and then also knowing the boundaries, which means know what you can and cannot step on, what is legal and what is not legal. 
next. All right. So how to report violations. I'm not going to go over this, but when you report, I would say, yes, you can call if there's a major problem, like you're smelling gas or you're smelling the sulfur. If it's dangerous or what call 911, it's also another form of it being documented that you called. It's a, a part of your due diligence. And so that's first and foremost, anything that is safety hazard, make sure you call 911. Don't post it on Facebook. Don't, you know, it has to go to them. The, um, you know, emergency services need to need because other people might be at risk. You know, you don't want to be posting that on Facebook and then go to the police or start being like, why aren't the police here? Well, they need to be notified. Um, and then go through this. I'm going to, you know, not go over all of this, like I said, but call and report as many places as possible when it makes sense, like the DEP or the EPA. We also have in Pennsylvania called the Public Utility Commission. Um, so they we have an intrastate line um, pipeline and they are in charge of a lot of the safety aspects or the integrity of the pipeline. And then the federal agency is the pipeline hazardous pipeline. It's FIMSA. It's called the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. Um, also, you know, there's when it comes to certain things like the Army Corps of Engineers, they only do trenching wetlands and waterways. So just know what these agencies do. But the more and more people that you tell um and like i said you'll always cc everybody when you do emails and show them that you did it and this is the next one notify local township leaders state representatives and state centers so when you make a complaint and you get your uh, response back make sure you forward that over to these people so nobody has the ability of plausible deniability and as well you're keeping them informed as to what is going on in their own community and i always say <laughs> use social media and press and be you know sometimes be careful with that make sure you do all of your due diligence and document things first and then you know when nobody's listening social media and the press is a really good um tool to help push things for you to get to get an answer or response so how to properly document your reporting well keep a journal i mean journaling is so important or maintain a google document if you're docu make sure you're documenting the date, time of all your complaints filed, meaning yes, you're doing it through that, but keep a log of the people you spoke with, the numbers you spoke with. And if you're talking to somebody on the phone, make sure that you follow, get their email, get their name, their number when you're on the phone with them. And then also follow the up with your conversation was via email. So it's written and, and traceable. By the way, if we do uh, FOIAs or right to know requests, people can find out that you did this and, it's a it's a very um, important aspect of communicating with our federal federal regulators or anybody else. Um, so save everything, by the way. Um, and I wanted to say that we have a new one in a PSR. It's called Tembu, and we're doing an air monitoring project. And what we're actually starting to do is journal. It's allowing us to journal next to um, like the spectrum of our uh, air monitor. So people, when they have a smell or they feel something. They can go to the, um, the, the air monitor reading and literally put in that time stamp like what they're experiencing. So it's now correlating, you know, the health impact or the experience of the, per, the um, resident alongside of some data, like scientific data, which is pretty stellar, I would say, my opinion. Um, so individual effort versus field team. I can imagine that, you know, this is overwhelming for a lot of people and people are like, I don't have the time or ability to do this. Uh, what, I, what I have done, um, and I don't expect anybody, but what I can tell you as a, the watchdog I've been, that I can't do what I do without my eyes and ears in my community. And so basically I could tell you that this company energy transfer cannot even like take a step on anybody's property without me finding out or one of my watchdogs. Um, and in the images, you see um, my co-founder of uh, Watchdogs of Southeastern Pennsylvania. It's our local group, uh, Laura Snyder, and my drone sitting there. And then, um, you know, I also actually, Senator Katie Muth is below that. Um, we, I, you know, we all here are watchdogs and at, there's so many layers of watchdogging, meaning it's just as simple as somebody who sees something, takes a picture and calls me. And then we can, you know, mobilize and, and make a decision as to how we want to um, move forward or what we can do. Because some people are just going to work and they can't stop and watch for an hour. I, if I can, if they tell me they saw something, I will go out and we work as a team. So field team members have flexible schedules, tools such as cameras, drones, and can be on call to deploy when needed. So it's very important for just, you know, any resident 
watchdog to allow somebody to know who has these tools and we will absolutely deploy um, them when we're told. Um, building a field team supports residents by creating a greater capacity for documenting and reporting. It takes a village. That's what I'm going to say. And especially when we're working with a very toxic system and a large, you know, a lot of money, a lot more people, um, we have to have that solid foundation in our own communities and, you know, getting people to start looking up and, and seeing what's going on and understanding the behaviors and what's like happening around you is so critical. And this is what watchdogging teaches people to, 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 to learn about things they may not be paying attention to because life is really busy for a lot of people and it's intended to keep us busy. <laughs> um, so you're not alone. That's it. With that, you're not alone is the biggest thing. So here's some of the equipment I have and I'm not everybody has to have it, but I want you guys to be aware of some of the things that I have. And I've been blessed by the way, by uh, getting this uh, uh, from like, you know, organizations like PSRPA, um, with the FLIR optical gas imaging camera, which is, I know the last bullet point, but you can see um, in the images to the right, that is an image of um, the Shell Cracker plant in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, which is a petrochemical plant, uh, ethane cracker plant, and they've had so many violations and that community has done such a great job. So I, I will give a shout out to BCMAC and Eyes on Shell for um, you know engaging their community and watchdogging. Um, this was what I captured in a, um, you know, event that was, uh, I think, later known to be a um, a violation of their air quality permits. And um, drones, you know, I have a drone. Uh, personal protective equipment is so important. You guys have to protect yourself when you're out there, such as gloves if you're going to take samples. Um, you know, a, a yellow jacket if you're, like, walking on the side of a road documenting. You want to make sure you're seen. And um, I'm going to say my favorite one is muck boots. Because if you're going into some of these places, which you'll see in my uh, case study, Whew. you um you're going to get really dirty <laughs> so you're going to want to have something that's waterproof and actually protects your uh, feet cuz they can get cold and that's you need to keep walking um air monitoring i have uh you know like a methane meter um you know there's other folks like uh Lori Barr for example who is doing orphan and abandoned wells out in um you know in, in Pennsylvania always carries you know methane meters this is very important for that so specific to the work and what you're doing make sure you're looking at the equipment don't like get everything don't spend your money on things that are unnecessary for what you're you know what you're actually targeting or what you're trying to document um you don't have to have all the cool toys but make sure you have the the um you know toys that you need in order to um you know further your case or prove legally or just you know help validate some of these experience that you know they're having and a lot of this um is for me has been about validating people's experiences that have been ignored by other people such as our agencies department of health for example um so we're just you know as a team working to help these people be heard and also for themselves to feel not crazy because they're not crazy and that's what we've proven by documenting and um Geiger counter is one that reads um, for radiation. Very important one, especially working in fracking um, infrastructure. And then I always kind of try to have in my kit like um, some kind of sampling container because you never know what you're going to walk up on. And it's really important to collect samples, which I will talk about later. Um, a field notebook, very important. And um, we can move on. So that's just like an example of what you could have. Not all those things. Oh, the binocular and monocular is very important. That's a simple thing you could have. And that's so you don't have to like, if you can't trespass, you can get an idea of what they're doing and observe them from far. Um, keeps you safe. And you could be a little more covert because they won't know you're looking, but you can see them still. Um, so here's the first case study. I, the one case study. I don't know. I have number one. I meant to remove that, but I'm only doing one case study. And this is Marsh Creek Lake in Chester County. Um, I'm in Upper Euclid Township in Pennsylvania here. Um, so this is actually a timeline of what happened. This started way back in 2017, um, where you know our DEP permitted this company to utilize horizontal directional drilling, which basically is boring underneath features uh, such as water features, rivers, roads, and um, the way they're using it here is to bore under people, uh, population dense area, because they kind of wanted to get their pipe in and you can't disrupt a lot of uh, people. It's suburbia, so like, they're not gonna be able to trench through everything here. But um, so what they chose to do is uh, bore down. And again, I wanna make a very good point on this. Like an easement for pipelines is 50 feet. They can put pipes horizontally. Um, they have to be separated by a certain distance for safety reasons. 
Um, and so now they're able to vertically, so they can stack them. So it's, I want people to be very aware of horizontal directional drilling. And here's an, this case is gonna teach people why it's such a dangerous, um, it's, it's a hazardous process if it's not done right. And if um, you know our regulators are not doing the proper impact studies such as groundwater impact studies. Um, so you can see uh, what you see in these videos right now, I mean, in this uh, in the images, sorry, let me go back. In the images right here, this is actually um, what's called an inadvertent return that occurred in 2020. Um, and you can see in the uh, image below, that's um, called Marsh Creek Lake. It's a um, water, it's a reservoir, it's a man-made lake, but it is actually a, um, it's drinking water for millions of people downstream of us. And as well, it is considered that area looking at is an exceptional value wetland. Um, all around it. And so it's really hard to get a designation of that. And they were permitted to try to drill under it, but their uh, drilling fluid, which you're seeing that line, that's what came out of the ground. Um, so our our entire DEP had to go through this, uh, it's called a reevaluation. Um, and we fought this for so many years. In fact, they put two pipelines in with the Mariner East. And one was the 16 inch and the other one, the second one, which caused this major inadvertent return was the 20 inch. Now the 16 inch also had problems when they drilled and they put them right next to each other. And when they permitted, they tried to say there's no risk of inadvertent return. Well, they were wrong. And as uh, the public, we um, have the ability in these permitting processes to have what's called public comment. And um, all of us, like, when I say all of us, we really put a big push on doing those public comments, doing public hearings, testifying. And in that, we literally said over and over that we were wanting a groundwater impact study that if they had this problem in the first pipe, why are they saying there's a low risk of what's called an inadvertent return? Well, they still permitted it. And so here we are in 2024. And so you can see in 2017, you are, are seeing, um, in the first image to the left, um, those like those white barriers are actually called um, like they're uh, sandbags, and they're that's an indicator that there has been a spill or that they have to contain something in a um, area where they do not like specifically around a waterway. They're trying to prevent it from getting into the waterways of Pennsylvania or an exceptional value of wetland or the tributary that feeds Marsh Creek Lake, which is what we're seeing here. They actually. Um, had it in 2017 on the first pipe. So DEP did a reevaluation and said, we're going to do it a little bit deeper. We're going to allow you to do this drilling, but deeper. So it went down to 220 something feet. And what do you know happened in the 2020? You see again, the lake with the spill that got into it. And I want to tell you that the drill pad, you can see in the background, like towards the right around this area, that is actually the drill pad back there. It actually traveled a half mile almost through the tributary to make it to the lake. This is about 8,000, as they claimed, gallons of drilling fluid. They try to say it's bentonite. It is bentonite, but it also has additives. So bentonite is only one component. And they have um, greenwashed bentonite trying to say it's in cat litter and makeup and whatnot, but it, and that it's um, naturally, it's natural. It is not natural to this area. It comes from Wisconsin, um, which we're not in Wisconsin, so it's not natural or indigenous to this area. And below uh, the lake picture, you can see the actual, again, berms that's containing now two sinkholes because they had ground substance happen. And that's where the inadvertent, inadvertent return came out. And as you look back to 2017, it's kind of funny. You see that little pond? It's in the same place, the same exact place. So here we are in two, 2024. All right, so they finished drilling. The pipe's been in for two years. They were finished their clean up from their spill two years ago. And there's no construction happening right now. And the other week we had um, a return of a substance um, in 2024 with no construction. And I'm gonna explain why that's so important. So here in 2024, we're still dealing with this. And you can see how the waters of the Pennsylvania, of this tributary has been muddied. That's silting or whatever that is, has uh, entered into the water column. And that is not okay. That's actually a violation of law because you know, we're coming up on spring and you have um, this, what bentonite does to macroinvertebrates or and anything with gills, just like kind of asbestos would do to humans if we inhale it. It's kind of dangerous for our lungs, really dangerous. This same thing, bentonite does that same 
everything to the fish gills and as well suffocates macroinvertebrates, which is so important to the ecology here, especially in an exceptional value wetland. Um, and I don't know why my thing's not moving now. Oh, there we go. So again, here you can see an overview with the drone, which is why it becomes very useful. Um, I could, you know, it's hard to get back there. It's very swampy. And as well, there's private property. So the drone gave me the ability to actually see what's going on. And you can see how muddy that is. And it's going like the entire tributary in these woods right here are um, covered. And um, the reason why I have this um, other thing next to it, which is conclusions and recommendations, is the synthesis. You, don't get too caught up in this. I don't want you to read it. But what it's basically saying is that there is a high, uh, uh, there's a high risk for this invertent return to happen. This came out of the Environmental Hearing Board, which is our PA DEP's, um, like I guess legal, or like it's where we can protest um, a permit. And um, this is a court case uh, that was uh, evaluating after the inadvertent return because they wanted to finish their their pipeline, but um, we were saying no more. And in the original one that was um, when we were commenting as people, they we were saying this exact thing, but now after it happened, they're saying, oh, you know, it is a high risk. When before they were actually kind of um, pushing it off and the DEP said it was a low risk for an inadvertent return. Um, and an inadvertent return, I'm sorry if I'm saying that without explaining it, it means that like drilling mud that goes down into the ground that they need to do use when they're drilling to lubricate the drill and to keep, you know, the annulus or the, the bore hole, um, you know, smooth and as well fills in cracks and fissures so, you know, they can continue the process. Um, it, inadvertent return means it came to the surface, right? So that's when, and I don't like the word inadvertent, I'm just going to say that right now, but um. Here is what happens when they have a sinkhole or, yeah, by the way, it's not really legal to use uh, grout. So this is a, um, a process that they do. They just dump grout into the sinkhole to fill it in and like plug it up. This has happened. Uh, I don't know if somebody's on here from memories, you could tell them how many sinkholes and how many, um, you know, cement and grout trucks that we have. And they supposedly say this is specific to sinkholes which again, we live in a karst area, which is very prone to sinkholes. If anybody understands that, I hope, yeah, it's like anybody who's ever caved knows that karst is where you like go and there's caverns and you can climb. That's all, there's a, a belt of that here and they decided to drill through it, which, you know, any geologist would say that was not smart. And you can even see the divot right there um, forward. That's actually the path of the pipeline, which we are just like, well, if that thing's 20, I believe it's going down to like, 50 feet at this spot under the ground. And we're seeing signs of possibly their borehole collapsing. Um, this is after the stop. So, you know, in August of 2020, that's when the invert return, the pause was created because they had to finish um, the whole court process and they were finally allowed to disturb and do this. But in the meantime, their borehole was open. I believe it did collapse. So that is just some drone imagery for you guys. All right, so where are we now in 2024? Well. Yeah, you can see this from the state impact article. It happened again. And why I put this in is because they said due to Mariner East pipeline construction, but um, we live here, there is no construction. It's done. So why did it come out of the ground? I can tell you that. So um, <laughs> I have an image here in my drone again. You can see the muddied waters on both sides. That is the um, you know fluid uh, drilling fluid in the tributary and as well the waters um, time stamped again. I'm journeying to show that these guys could not actually go into our um, tributary or, or wetland anymore with heavy machinery. So they had to actually scoop it up with their hands and carry it with a five gallon bucket. But what they ended up doing was bringing a generator or something down and washing it out, like trying to wash the, you know, spill out and then um, suck it up with a, uh, some suction device. And what I want you guys to see is that behind them, it's obviously getting further in and the picture to the left, to the right, I'm sorry, is actually the tributary downstream of that. So they were not doing a very good job at protecting the waterways, which I had to formal, formalize two more complaints to the DEP and still the, to this day, I have not heard back. All right, so where are we now again? If you look at this and um, here's what the uh, PA Environmental Digest blog had written uh, because this is what um, energy transfer actually told the DEP. 
A clay-like material polluting Marsh Creek is not bentonite for Mariner East Pipeline construction, but naturally occurring. Sunoco cleanup is finished. Well, I've been documenting that. That is untrue. Um, and the thing is, is those samples that the DEP is claiming or anybody stating is actually take samples taken by energy transfer, analyzed by them, the criminal, and they're reporting that as if it is true. DEP is awaiting their own samples, and I have collected my own samples, which we're trying to fundraise to get analyzed, because you have to get a certified lab, an independent sample is so critical, so critical. So don't always rely on your regulators. Make sure you got your own sample. And um, you know there are so many organizations that can help you with sampling or call a lab and talk to like a project manager and they'll, they'll walk you through it or you can contact me. Um, so these pictures to the left, if you look at these two pictures, one is from 2024, which is recent. The one in the middle is from 2020 when it was declared a release of bentonite. I don't think I see any difference, but interesting that they're trying to say, you know, and the reason why we're talking about inadvertent returns occurred. This is not an inadvertent turn. If you look at this little tiny piece down below that, uh, it says LOC, which is called a loss of circulation. This is what they don't talk about in drilling. Loss of circulation is a loss of fluid, which is an acceptable term and it's an acceptable thing. I mean, Look at it, it says 20,000, 22,000 gallons. And, and this is only one sheet. There's 140,000 gallons of loss of circulation, meaning fluid loss under the ground in our water system. And all of a sudden it's, I mean, nobody cared. When they cleaned it up, they were saying, oh, you know, we cleaned up what's on the surface, but it's funny that the earth decided to burp out what is under the ground and what they choose to ignore, which is one of my issues with it. If they would have done a groundwater impact study, it would have happened. So, what, what impact did the watchdogs have? We didn't stop our pipeline. Yes, we're still getting harmed by it. But out of this, we have the attorney general. Uh, it, he did a grand jury and it led to criminal charges under environmental statutes, which only allows them to fine. So kind of a slap on the wrist, but you know, um, PA D Department of Environmental Protection is now making rules to address horizontal directional drilling. And the big one is PA Public Utility Commission is doing rulemaking on enhancements to regulations for hazardous liquids pipelines. That's FIMS of uh, 49 CFR 195, which is what um, our pipeline is regulated under. And so I find it really interesting. All of these things, if you look at the language down below that, it literally addresses horizontal directional drilling. So the last part is additionally, there are no retroactive designs or construction regulations for those pipeline facilities exist that exist when the rule is made effective by operate. We're not grandfathered in. So we were basically guinea pigs. They got their pipeline in. And then our regulators were like, wow, all those things that you guys documented and complained about, um, we're gonna make rules about it. And this is very important because we're also dealing with carbon dioxide pipelines coming in, which are liquefied gas. And that will be mentioned in this. And so our PAPUC is actually further enhancing federal regulations, which every state should be doing. So. You know, that's a really important, I would say we didn't stop the pipeline, but we actually got some um, changes. So I am going to say that watchdogs are always watching and thank you for uh, talking. Um, and if there's any questions, please let me know. There are some questions. So the first is from Kate. How would you get your water tested? Who would test it? And what should they look for? And if you know, how much would that cost? Mm -hmm. um, so there are several levels. I mean, if you have a well, for example, um, which I am on well, you, you have a, we have a water person who takes care of our well. We go through that, but that testing is pretty much going to be bacteria. And um, what's what basically the EPA says is potable water. It's not going to go through the full gamut of um, specific materials. So if you have a concern about something that has harmed your water, like there's PFAS or what we're dealing with, you're going to have to go through and talk to an analytical chemist or a, a, a certified lab, talk to a project manager, let them know your concerns, and they'll um, let you know what you should have analyzed. And you need to be looking for the things that, that are of concern. And of course, I would always do the typical um, analytical testing, which is like turbidity, uh, your pH, making sure you do that. Um, it's, it can be quite costly in the thousands. Um, some are some tests are even eight hundred dollars. What we're dealing with for what I'm asking for, which is X-ray diffraction for bentonite, it's four thousand dollars for a sample. So it's a lot of money, um, and you know you might have to cut costs by um, really sp specifically looking for things that are most harmful to you and your family. If that's it, um, I that's what I'd say focus on. 
Um, so don't have to get everything done at once. I hope that answered it. Oh, and it, there are several labs, by the way, out there. Um, there's, you know, in each state, um, if you guys have any questions, I can, you know, answer that. Um, we're going to have resources as well on our uh, website. So um, I can't really, I don't want to say any particular lab personally, but you need to go to an analogical lab that specializes in environmental and drinking water. When you're dealing with it, make sure they're drinking water standards. Next question from Yvonne. Can you talk about what is possible to observe legally and practically with a drone? Um, I, I would say, all right, legally, practically, if you're droning in like neighborhoods, be cautious, do not be like, hovering over people's houses. You can't hover over people's heads technically, um, legally too, uh, but you can be off, offset yourself from the uh, target that you're looking at. And you can, I don't think there's any limitations except when you're in a no fly zone and your drone has an electric fence and uh, they're hooked up to this electric fence. So if there is a no fly zone or something to that effect, such as like we have President Biden who comes home to Delaware, the entire area is a no fly zone and I cannot fly my drone. So like you're told by drones where you can and cannot fly. Um, you know, I, I say always work within an ethical way of that. And realistically, I have not seen anything that has prevented me other than the um, electronic fence, the no fly zones from um, not documenting. You cannot obviously fly in rain and high winds, um, but you know, I, you know, always keep line of sight too of your drone. So I always have a spotter. So these are things, um, if you do these things, I believe there's not much that's going to stop you. And by the way, if somebody tries to mess with your drone in the air, that is absolutely against the law and the FBI can be called out um, because that's like an act of war, I believe, and check me on that. But the FAA is very strict that you cannot impede with anything in flight. I hope that answered it. Another question from Yvonne. I thought there were rules about how close you could fly above private property. I'm not familiar with that, but you cannot. Um, the one rule in flight is that there's a 500 foot ceiling where helicopters and other uh, larger aircraft are not allowed to fly. For us, we can't go above 500. So you're not allowed to breach that zone. Um, that's a safety hazard. And as well, you know, you're supposed to have a flight plan. So, you know, and you, you're supposed to talk to um, the local airport or something and make sure that, you know, you're approved or that there's no low flying flights, for example. Like um, if you've ever been near an electric easement, there are helicopters that drop lower because they're doing work on lines. You want to make sure that that's not there. But um, as per private property, nobody owns the air. That's it. You know, they, they don't, people don't own the air. I mean, we don't even own our mineral reeds down below us. You can buy them. You cannot buy the air. And if you're a high profile target, such as, um, so, oh, state parks are another one. You can't launch from a state park, but you can fly into one. Um, you, uh, you, when it comes to high profile people, their properties, uh, like again, the electronic fence should tell you that, but um, they're not going to let you fly near those. That's only, I, I mean, if, if you have any other experience, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Chris. It looks like that's all of our questions. Thank you everyone for joining us. The recording of this will go out tomorrow or the next day. It'll also be available on the website and our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Keep watching.